Okay, so uh, first off, of course, thank you to all the organizers for bringing up work here, Professor Yui, uh, Jacqueline, uh, Jessica, and all the graduate students. Uh, this is a uh, <coughs> conference, I'm having so much fun, and really looking forward to presenting a little bit about a case study I've been working on. So this is uh, this kind of strange, bizarre case of a uh, bakery in Tasmania, far, far away from <coughs> uh, uh, hustle and bustle city life that's become the center of this anime tourism pilgrimage. And this paper's trying to get to the bottom of uh, why tourists, why visitors from Japan were so powered to, to uh, uh, run with this interest uh, in, in the Ross paper. So this is, a, this is an image which is kind of a montage of the three spaces. Is that it? Uh, a montage of the three spaces which are uh, kind of at the center of this. So we have uh, Michael Takubu Kiki looking out from her role in the bakery. And then we have two bakery shops, right? Part of the confusion here is that there are two bakeries in this little tiny village of Ross in Tasmania. One of them has been caught up in this rumor that it's the center of the inspiration of the bakery in Majum uh, The other one serves better tea and coffee. Uh, so there's quite a bit of confusion as people travel around that area. Uh, so what I'm going to unpack is again uh, uh, how this issue of the authenticity of the location gets discussed and some of the conflicts which emerged from the visitors arriving in this location. Uh, my main argument here is uh, that the fans' discussion of the bakery demonstrates uh, debate around appropriating the virtual into the real. Uh, and what I've got throughout my uh, slides are a series of uh, screenshots from the visitors' books which Japanese visitors left at the bakery in Ross, Tasmania. So this is a kind of indicative paradox sketch that the visitors created as they've traveled there. Uh, Hello, I am alive. <laughs> yes, almost. There we go. Yes. Hello. Okay. Uh, so again, uh, a sketch which is mapping out the uh, a little map of Tasmania, a small island off the southern coast of, Ta of Australia, uh, as well as this kind of celebration of being in Tasmania through a window from anime from Kiki's delivery service, Majin uh, uh And again, but this is a short description about. Uh, uh, how much they've loved Ross, and how much they've found Majin Otakubin in the most unlikely of locations in Ross. Uh, so what I want to do, the, the structure of my paper is just going to uh, characterize a little bit of the background. Uh, this photo is actually of the accommodation above the bakery uh, in Ross called Kiki's Room, which they've tried to create to s simulate. Uh, the desire of Japanese visitors to experience the Majin Otakubin moment. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the background that led up to uh, kind of daily pilgrimages that the bakery was uh, finding it in the center of here, five to seven Japanese visitors a day. Uh, some of the defining characteristics of being a fan, a uh, Kiki fan in particular, and a tourist, and where those overlap and don't. Uh, and finally, some of the internal challenges, which I find one of the most interesting spaces here that it's not just a straightforward uh, embracing of a fantasy moment. There's a lot of debate, conflict, and uh, uh, different power structures and issues which are being played out. And uh, that's kind of nicely characterized by this, this idea of a symbolic management of Ross Bakery. There are many competing stakeholders which have kind of not, not perfectly aligned agendas. So you, of course, have the primal texts, uh, Kiki's Delivery Service, Majin uh, and the Ross Bakery. Uh, but then you have these, these communities, all of which are much more fragmented than I've demonstrated or I'll show here, but, but it, it shows you the kind of stakeholders. You've got fan culture, uh, Kiki fans, Ghibli fans, who uh, are going to pilgrimages to Ross. You have the bakery owners that are attempting to negotiate this story. Again, they're not. Bakery owners aren't anime fans. And they're trying to, they've, over the last 10, 15 years, been trying to get to the bottom of this rumor. Uh, tour operators who are increasingly kind of creating a cottage industry based around some of the perceived similarities between Australia's geography and Ghibli movies, uh, everything from Norsega to Lionel uh, Tuckerman. And news media, how the news media themselves are framing and reframing and mediating uh, the story of the, uh, the Lost Bakery. 
And the final player, which is kind of at the margins actually, is Studio Ghibli itself uh, and, and its role uh, within, within the circulation of this, this kind of urban legend or rumour connecting the Ross Bakery to Tasmania. All right. So there are two quick key questions that I was addressing when I was looking at the, uh, the visitors books as well as interviewing the bakery staff and talking to some of the Japanese visitors who were going to Tasmania and those were uh, how do the fans themselves describe their experience? What type of identities? Were they framing their experience around in particular? And secondly, what conflicts uh, brought this side under question? You know, what were some of the debates? What were some of the concerns that uh, uh, kind of revealed some of the, uh, the different agendas and different economies that were coming into play uh, with this this moment. So, and again, uh, 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 these of books were a kind of uh, archive, a little data mine of information, and they date all the way back to 2004, uh, so it's so quite a few really fascinating insights. And again, through studying this, I think it's engaging with some bigger questions, uh, which I'm hoping to move towards theoretically, but again, this is just a very small case study at this point, but but more broadly, I think doing projects like this gets us to consider the role of media in shaping our perception of place. And again, how that, that media frame doesn't guarantee a kind of enlightened, progressive, culturally sensitive understanding that that media framing can be uh, uh, quite stereotyping and problematic. Uh, and secondly, uh, I guess how fans use popular culture to scaffold their expressions around. Uh, that was one of the aspects that I found most interesting looking at the visitors' books and talking to fans, how they were often talking about various other issues through the margin of Takubin's story, uh, and particularly around evaluating the credibility of a media location through different value hierarchies. So many of, many of the fans were talking about margin of Takubin but through that, talking about quite complicated issues about value, the value of their experience generally. So many of the Japanese who were coming to the bakery were working holiday visa holders, foreign uh, international students, uh, uh, very young. And again, this experience at the bakery was almost a, a kind of a moment of reflection where they were trying to make sense of the last year or two of their lives. And this convergence of Majima Takubin, the bakery, and Ross uh, brought together this synergy of, of reflection. So a little bit of case study background. So there's some images there. That's the bakery up the top. You can see they're serving uh, some of the, the wonderful bread. Uh, the oven, which is a kind of primal site, which many people link to one of the reasons the rumor was spread, that this oven's very similar to the oven in Majima Takubin. There's the uh, Kiki, of course, from the, the anime Majima Takubin. And there's, you know, there's some nice similarities there. You can possibly start feeling some of the similar atmospheres and evocations, which might lead some Japanese to feel there is a, is a link. Uh, so a little bit of background, firstly, around uh, Majima Takubin. What's really interesting and I think important to keep in mind is the role of Kiki's delivery service, the English title, Majima Takubin, of course, in Japanese. Uh, I mean, 89, 1989 was when Majin no Takubin was released, so it's, it's had an interesting life cycle. And I think it's, you know, the fact that uh, it was one of the uh, best-selling anime DVDs in June 2001 and has repeatedly been shown on TV since has kind of established its role as a, as a kind of nostalgic moment for many, particularly young females who came to Ross. They often reflect back on the fact that you know, they're in this uh, bakery, they're, they're at Kiki's room, and they're watching Majin no Takubin and thinking about their childhood, thinking about uh, uh, when they first watched this movie uh, much earlier in life. So again, I think Majin no Takubin and its development in a particular moment of being released also coincides with, with kind of a growing up story which I want to focus on. A little bit more background. One of the most fascinating things about digging a bit deeper into the story was actually, you know, hearing what Jubilee is positioning as their main references. And of course, one of the things about the story is that it's an improvised story. When you actually look at Ghibli's influences, uh, uh, sadly, Tasmania doesn't feature as one of the influences, right? So it's one of the ironies. 
But Ghibli, uh, so, so Marginal Calcubin actually draws upon locations in Sweden, so the animation staff did source real locations, and Ghibli is now producing material to inspire further media tourism, but uh, uh, so Sweden, UK, uh, featured as locations they hunted for uh, areas, and we found this by going to their blog, and one of their animator staff actually blogged about this bizarre story of <laughs> Japanese going to Tasmania and things that <laughs> found it. Right, so again, uh, this is the kind of like, <laughs> I don't know where this is coming from, kind of reaction to it. Uh, interestingly, again, uh, what I find fascinating is Ghibli's role and, and negotiation of, to this is, is really marginal. They've not attempted to control or kind of uh, uh, prohibit uh, any uh, use of this material. And one of the interesting paradoxes of this is, of course, that the bakery staff when I was doing this research really wanted me to find out if it was true or not. Uh, and I had to say, well, no, my, my research is something that never came here. And one of the funniest things was the bakery staff said, well, actually, we think maybe the book's author came here. Uh, because, of course, Marginal Takubin is based on a book. And the, uh, and the bakery staff was saying, well, it, okay, even though Ghibli may not have come here, we think the baker, uh, we think the, the author of the book came here. So, again, there's this wonderful rumor and series of, 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 of kind of urban legends powering this. Uh, again, Ishichan's show and Japanese media have been involved in framing this as well. Uh, I'll show this clip at the end if I have time, uh, but I just wanted to flag the fact that uh, uh, various Japanese TV shows have now visited Ross and done uh, short episodes on, uh, wow, this is clearly Ghibli's Marginal Takubin's Bakery. Uh, uh, there we have the kind of cosplay they're in the performance of. And again, this is kind of reinforcing and creating this wonderful uh, or Durian simulacra moment where, where it's kind of being self-reinforced by re remediation space. Uh, also, this is Nishigo Press, which is in Australia, the Japanese language newspaper. Uh, they featured a story on Tasmania, this is back in 2006, but what I love about this is, all right, the first uh, column here is your typical map of Tasmania with its highlights of cows and beautiful nature, very banal material, there's a map of of Hobart, the main city in Tasmania. The, uh, the other column, though, is kind of, this is the Ghibli world in Tasmania. This is where Ghibli has sourced locations, three spots, which uh, the, the, the paper again is claiming formed the inspiration for a number of Ghibli-produced uh, materials. So again, there's this wonderful dichotomy between a real and virtual representation that's, that's nicely counterposed there. Just to give you a sense of geography, of course, here's Australia. That little green dot is Tasmania, right? So quite isolated, separate from the mainland. Uh, even further than that, uh, uh, there's, there's, there's Tasmania blown up a bit bigger. Ross, tiny, tiny little speck of a town in between the two main cities, Hobart and Launceston. It's bypassed by the, the, the main highway, so not many people go to it. So it's very much a kind of, uh, uh, a, a kind of impoverished, kind of location. I mean, Tasmania is also the poorest state in Australia, so again, it's a location which really draws a lot of its economy from tourism. So tourism is a very important part of Tasmania, and one of the things which is framing this discourse is around the dependency uh, the Ross Bakery has on this phenomenon. Many people uh, are kind of ambivalent about the impact Japanese tourists are having because of this Kiki connection. Uh, and one of the fascinating things was that even economically, it's not really bringing in the money that uh, you'd assume. In fact, they're selling the bakery if anyone is interested. Um, here's, here's Ross itself, just to again give you a little bit more background. As you can see, very small little uh, uh, convict-built town. It's considered to be uh, one of the, the most gorgeous convict-built towns in, in Australia. Uh, most well known, of course, for this little intersection there. There's a photo of it there. And you can kind of see the romantic vision of the the kind of colonial uh, uh, architecture, which is evocative of Ghibli's own uh, uh, kind of mise-en-scene. Uh, but you have these, these very deeply entrenched heritage spaces of Australia. So you have uh, the former jail site, the town hall, the hotel, and the church, all representing ideas of, of kind of colonial life. And again, this is the dominant frame of 